The ITT indicator gives an instantaneous reading of engine gas temperature between the compressor turbine and the power turbines. The torque meter responds to power lever movement and gives an indication in foot-pounds (ft/lb) of the torque being applied to the propeller. Because in the free turbine engine the propeller is not attached physically to the shaft of the gas turbine engine, two tachometers are justified, one for the propeller and one for the gas generator. The propeller tachometer is read directly in revolutions per minute. The N1 or gas generator is read in percent of RPM. In the Pratt & Whitney PT6 engine, it is based on a figure of 37,000 RPM at 100%. Maximum continuous gas generator is limited to 38,100 RPM or 101.5% N1. The ITT indicator and torque meter are used to set takeoff power. Climb and cruise power are established with the torque meter and propeller tachometer while observing ITT limits. Gas generator, N1, operation is monitored by the gas generator tachometer. Proper observation and interpretation of these instruments provide an indication of engine performance and condition. Reverse thrust and beta range operations. The thrust that a propeller provides is a function of the angle of attack, AOA, at which the air strikes the blades, and the speed at which this occurs. The AOA varies with the pitch angle of the propeller. Forward pitch produces forward thrust, higher pitch angles being required at higher airplane speeds. Figure 15, 8A, so-called flat pitch, shown in figure 15, 8B, is the blade position offering minimum resistance to rotation and no net thrust for moving the airplane. End of page 15 to 8. The feathered position is the highest pitch angle obtainable. Figure 15, 8C. The feathered position produces no forward thrust. The propeller is generally placed in feather only in case of in-flight engine failure to minimize drag and prevent the air from using the propeller as a turbine. In the reverse pitch position, the engine slash propeller turns in the same direction as in the normal, forward, pitch position, but the propeller blade angle is positioned to the other side of flat pitch. Figure 15, 8D. In reverse pitch, air is pushed away from the airplane rather than being drawn over it. Reverse pitch results in braking action, rather than forward thrust of the airplane. It is used for backing away from obstacles when taxiing, controlling taxi speed, or to aid in bringing the airplane to a stop during the landing roll. Reverse pitch does not mean reverse rotation of the engine. The engine delivers power just the same, no matter which side of flat pitch the propeller blades are positioned. With a turboprop engine, in order to obtain enough power for flight, the power lever is placed somewhere between flight idle, in some engines referred to as high idle, and maximum. The power lever directs signals to a fuel control unit to manually select fuel. The propeller governor selects the propeller pitch needed to keep the propeller slash engine on speed. This is referred to as the propeller governing or alpha mode of operation. When positioned aft of flight idle, however, the power lever directly controls propeller blade angle. This is known as the beta range of operation. The beta range of operation consists of power lever positions from flight idle to maximum reverse. Beginning at power lever positions just aft of flight idle, propeller blade pitch angles become progressively flatter with aft movement of the power lever until they go beyond maximum flat pitch and into negative pitch, resulting in reverse thrust. While in a fixed shaft slash constant speed engine, the engine speed remains largely unchanged as the propeller blade angles achieve their negative values. On the split shaft PT6 engine, as the negative 5 degrees position is reached, further aft movement of the power lever also results in a progressive increase in engine N1 RPM until a maximum value of about negative 11 degrees of blade angle and 85% N1 are achieved. End of page 15 to 9. Operating in the beta range and or with reverse thrust requires specific techniques and procedures depending on the particular airplane make and model. Specific engine parameters and limitations for operations within this area should be adhered to. It is essential that a pilot transitioning to turboprop airplanes becomes knowledgeable and proficient in these areas, which are unique to turbine engine-powered airplanes. Turboprop Airplane Electrical Systems the typical turboprop airplane electrical system is a 28-volt direct current DC, system, which receives power from one or more batteries and a starter-slash-generator for each engine. The batteries are either lead-acid, nickel-cadmium, NICAD, or lithium-ion. 
When battery voltage is low, its ability to turn the compressor for engine start is greatly diminished, and the possibility of engine damage due to a hot start increases. Therefore, it is essential to check the battery's condition before every engine start. The different battery types have different operating characteristics depending on the specific aircraft installation and operational environment. The DC generators used in turboprop airplanes double as starter motors and are called starter slash generators. The starter slash generator uses electrical power to produce mechanical torque to start the engine and then uses the engine's mechanical torque to produce electrical power after the engine is running. Some of the DC power produced is changed to 28 volt 400 cycle alternating current AC power for certain avionic, lighting, and indicator synchronization functions. This is accomplished by an electrical component called an inverter. The distribution of DC and AC power throughout the system is accomplished through the use of power distribution buses. These buses as they are called are actually common terminals from which individual electrical circuits get their power. Figure 15, 9. End of page 15 to 10. Buses are usually named for what they power, avionics bus, for example, or for where they get their power, right generator bus, battery bus. The distribution of DC and AC power is often divided into functional groups, buses, that give priority to certain equipment during normal and emergency operations. Main buses serve most of the airplane's electrical equipment. Essential buses feed power to equipment having top priority. Figure 15, 10. Multi-engine turboprop airplanes normally have several power sources, at least one generator per engine and at least one battery for the airplane. The electrical systems are usually designed so that any bus can be energized by any of the power sources. For example, a typical system has a left and right engine generator powered bus. While these buses are normally isolated, they may be fed from other power sources. However, in the event of a short circuit, the bus remains isolated. Pilots should refer to the appropriate checklist when an electrical fault occurs. Power distribution buses are protected from short circuits and other malfunctions by a type of fuse called a current limiter. In the case of excessive current supplied by any power source, the current limiter opens the circuit and thereby isolates that power source and separates the affected bus from the system. If this occurs, pilots should refer to the appropriate checklist. Operational Considerations As previously stated, a turboprop airplane flies just like any other piston engine airplane of comparable size and weight. It is the operation of the engines and airplane systems that makes the turboprop airplane different from its piston engine counterpart. Pilot errors in engine and or systems operation are common causes of aircraft damage or loss of aircraft control. There are two engine-related issues that should be considered when a pilot transitions to turboprop operations. The first issue concerns the split shaft slash free turbine engine, where power output lags for several seconds when the pilot moves the power lever from flight idle to a high power setting. This delay may surprise a pilot who has only flown airplanes with a piston engine or a fixed shaft turboprop. Certain operations such as firefighting and agricultural application require maneuvering close to the ground while operating at or near flight idle. Although smooth power applications are still the rule, the pilot should be aware that a greater physical movement of the power levers is required as compared to throttle movement in a piston engine. The pilot should understand the lag and anticipate and lead the power changes more than in the past and should keep in mind that the last 30% of engine RPM represents the majority of the engine thrust. Below that setting, the application of power has very little effect. End of page 15 to 11. A second consideration for transitioning pilots concerns turbine engine heat sensitivity. A turbine engine cannot tolerate an over-temperature condition for more than a very seconds without experiencing serious damage. Engine temperatures get hotter during starting than at any other time. Thus, turbine engines have minimum rotational speeds for introducing fuel into the combustion chambers during startup. Vigilant monitoring of temperature and acceleration on the part of the pilot remain crucial until the engine is running at a stable speed. Successful engine starting depends on assuring the correct minimum battery voltage before initiating start or employing a ground power unit GPU, of adequate output. After fuel is introduced to the combustion chamber during the start sequence, light off and its associated heat rise occur very quickly. Engine temperatures may approach the maximum in a matter of 2 or 3 seconds before the engine stabilizes and temperatures fall into the normal operating range. 
During this time, the pilot should watch for any tendency of the temperatures to exceed limitations and be prepared to cut off fuel to the engine. An engine tendency to exceed maximum starting temperature limits is termed a hot start. The temperature rise may be preceded by unusually high initial fuel flow, which may be the first indication the pilot has that the engine start is not proceeding normally. Serious engine damage occurs if the hot start is allowed to continue. A condition where the engine is accelerating more slowly than normal is termed a hung start or false start. During a hung start slash false start, the engine may stabilize at an engine RPM that is not high enough for the engine to continue to run without help from the starter. This is usually the result of low battery power or the starter not turning the engine fast enough for it to start properly. Takeoffs in turboprop airplanes are not made by automatically pushing the power lever full forward to the stops. As stated earlier, depending on conditions, takeoff power may be limited by either torque or by engine temperature. Normally, the power lever position on takeoff is somewhat aft of full forward. Takeoff and departure in a turboprop airplane, especially a twin-engine cabin-class airplane, should be accomplished in accordance with a standard takeoff and departure profile developed for the particular make and model. Figure 15, 11. The takeoff and departure profile should be in accordance with the airplane manufacturer's recommended procedures as outlined in the Federal Aviation Administration FAA, approved airplane flight manual and or the pilot's operating handbook AFM POH. The increased complexity of turboprop airplanes makes the standardization of procedures a necessity for safe and efficient operation. The transitioning pilot should review the profile procedures before each takeoff to form a mental picture of the takeoff and departure process. End of page 15 to 12. For any given high horsepower operation, the pilot can expect that the engine temperature will climb as altitude increases at a constant power. On a warm or hot day, maximum temperature limits may be reached at a rather low altitude, making it impossible to maintain high horsepower to higher altitudes. Also, the engine's compressor section has to work harder with decreased air density. Power capability is reduced by high density altitude and power use may have to be modulated to keep engine temperature within limits. In a turboprop airplane, the pilot can close the throttles as at any time without concern for cooling the engine too rapidly. Consequently, rapid descents with the propellers in low pitch can be dramatically steep. Like takeoffs and departures, approach and landing should be accomplished in accordance with a standard approach and landing profile. Figure 15, 12. However, when flying an airplane equipped with a split shaft slash free turbine engine, the pilot should anticipate the demand for power and account for any lag in spool up time. A stabilized approach is an essential part of the approach and landing process. In a stabilized approach, the airplane, depending on design and type, is placed in a stabilized descent on a glide path ranging from 2.5 to 3.5 degrees. The speed is stabilized at some reference from the AFM slash POH, usually 1.25 to 1.30 times the stall speed in approach configuration. The descent rate is stabilized from 500 FPM to 700 FPM until the landing flare. Landing some turboprop airplanes, as well as some piston twins, can result in a hard, premature touchdown if the engines are idled too soon. This is because large propellers spinning rapidly in low pitch create considerable drag. In such airplanes, it may be preferable to maintain power throughout the landing flare and touchdown. Once firmly on the ground, propeller beta range operation dramatically reduces the need for braking in comparison to piston airplanes of similar weight. Training Considerations The medium and high altitudes at which turboprop airplanes are flown provide an entirely different environment in terms of regulatory requirements, airspace structure, physiological requirements, and even meteorology. The pilot transitioning to turboprop airplanes, particularly those who are not familiar with operations in the high-slash-medium altitude environment, should approach turboprop transition training with this in mind. Thorough ground training should cover all aspects of high-slash-medium altitude flight, including the flight environment, weather, flight planning and navigation, physiological aspects of high-altitude flight, oxygen and pressurization system operation, and high-altitude emergencies. End of page 15-13 Flight training should prepare the pilot to demonstrate a comprehensive knowledge of airplane performance, systems, emergency procedures, and operating limitations, along with a high degree of proficiency in performing all flight maneuvers and in-flight emergency procedures. 
The training outline below covers information used by pilots to operate safely at high altitudes. Ground Training 1. High Altitude Flight Environment At airspace and reduced vertical separation minimum RVSM, operations. B. Title 14 Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 91, Section 91.211, Requirements for Use of Supplemental Oxygen. 2. Weather A. Atmosphere B. Winds and clear air turbulence C. Icing 3. Flight planning and navigation A. A. Flight planning B. Weather charts C. Navigation D. Navigation aids, nav aids E. High altitude redesign, HR F. RNAV slash required navigation performance, RNP and receiver autonomous. Integrity monitoring, RAIM, prediction. 4. Physiological training. A. Respiration. B. Hypoxia. C. Effects of prolonged oxygen use. D. Decompression sickness. E. Vision. F. Altitude chamber, optional. 5. High altitude systems and components. F. Oxygen and oxygen equipment. B. A pressurization systems. C. High altitude components. 6. Aerodynamics and performance factors. A. Acceleration and deceleration. B. A gravity, G. Forces. C. A Mach Tuck and Mach Critical, turbojet airplanes. D. Swept wing concept. 7. Emergencies. A. Decompression. B. Donning of oxygen masks. C. Failure of oxygen mask or complete loss of oxygen supply slash system. D. In-flight fire. E. Flight into severe turbulence or thunderstorms. F. The compressor stalls. End of page 15 to 14. Flight training. 1. Pre-flight briefing. 2. Pre-flight planning. A weather briefing and considerations. B. Course plotting. C. Airplane flight manual, AFM. D. Flight plan. 3. Pre-flight inspection. A functional test of oxygen system, including the verification of supply and pressure, regulator operation, oxygen flow, mask fit, and pilot and air traffic control, ATC, communication using mask microphones. For engine start procedures, run-up, takeoff, and initial climb. 5. Climb to high altitude in normal cruise operations while operating above 25,000 feet mean sea level, MSL. 6. Emergencies A. Simulated rapid decompression, including the immediate donning of oxygen masks B. Emergency descent. 7. Planned descents. 8. Shutdown procedures. 9. Post-flight discussion. Chapter Summary Transitioning from a non-turbopropeller airplane to a turbopropeller-powered airplane is discussed in this chapter. The major differences are introduced specifically handling, power plant, and the associated systems. Turbopropeller electrical systems and operational considerations are explained to include starting procedures and high temperature considerations. Training considerations are also discussed and a sample training syllabus is given to show the topics that a pilot should become proficient in when transitioning to a turbopropeller-powered airplane. End of page 15 to 15. End of chapter 15. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Chapter 16 is coming soon.